Welcome to our first unit. Um, this is going to be related to global prehistory. This is your first recorded lecture. And um, prehistory means um, before the written word. So um, there's a whole slew of um, different cave paintings, sculptures, um, portable objects, um, tools, weapons um, that fall under this category um, and that we look at um, in art historical terms. Um, and these come from all over the globe. Um, and usually art history has focused most of their prehistoric art in Europe. Um, and that's usually been the focus of many introductions to the history of art. Um, very early art is found worldwide and shares certain features, particularly, particularly concerned with the natural wor world and humans, um, the human's place within it. So people created um, before they had the ability to write, and that's a really important concept for you to, to remember. They had the ability to create before writing, before cipher math, um, um, raising crops, domesticating animals, um, inventions such as the wheel, or um, you know, sort of the introduction to metal um, and using weapons. Um, they painted before they had anything that um, could be called clothing or lived in anything that resembled a house. Um, so this, this need and this desire to create um, is innate, I think, in, in sort of our human um, experience. And so it really is one of the, you know, really strongest of human impulses. Unfortunately, it is not known why these people painted or sculpted since no written record survives. All attempts to explain prehistoric motivations are founded on speculation. From the first, however, art seems to have a function. Remember, this is one of the concepts that we did discuss when we were talking about our paradigm of art historical analysis. These works do not merely decorate or amuse, they are designed with a purpose in mind. So periods of time before the written record are often defined in terms of geological eras or major shifts in climate and the environment. The periods of global prehistory, um, known as lithic, L-I-T-H-I-C, or the Stone Age, are Paleolithic, Old Stone Age. And so that's what that term translates to. Just sound it out. You know, don't worry about spelling on your notes because it will take me forever to kind of spell things out. You will later have access to my lecture notes after you turn in your note packets. Um, Mesolithic, which means Middle Stone Age, and Neolithic, which is New Stone Age. So Neo means new, Paleo is old, okay? And those really are the two that we're gonna focus on. We might not look too much at um, Middle Stone Age. A glacial period produced European ice ages. Um, Saharan agriculture grassland um, became desert, and tectonic shifts in Southeast Asia created land bridges between the continents and the now islands of the Pacific south of the equator. Human behavior and expression was influenced by the changing environments in which these prehistoric people lived. So here I have a list of periods and definitions for you, so you might want to look at this um, more intensely. I'm not going to read every single word, um, but these are concepts and ideas that um, we should think about um, when we are looking at some of the um, prehistoric art um, in this unit. Again, prehistory or prehistoric period refers to the time before the written records, and what's important to get out of this is that human expression and this need to create existed across the globe long before writing. Um, writing emerged at different times in different parts of the world. The earliest writing is found in ancient Mesopotamia, which is um, a unit that we will be looking at later in this course. Um, Homo sapiens, modern humans are a subspecies. Homo sapiens migrated out of Africa between um, 120,000 and 50,000 years ago. Again, the Stone Age is a prehistoric period with stone implement, where stone implements were used widely. The Stone Age is divided into the Paleolithic, Old Stone Age, and Neolithic, New Stone Age. After the Stone Age, the next periods are known as the Bronze Age, Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Now, this next um, concept is really important for you guys to grasp. Historians distinguish the Neolithic period, the New Stone Age, 
by the transition from people living as hunters and gatherers to the development of farming and the domestication of animals. So with this transition from Paleolithic to Neolithic, we're gonna, really gonna see people settling down from a migratory lifestyle. And we'll see that the art changes quite drastically in style and function. The Neolithic revolution allowed people to create a more settled way of life. This happened at a different time in different parts of the world. The first agricultural, um, agriculture occurred in the Southwest, in Southwest Asia, in an area historians call the Fertile Crescent. And you will learn more about that, um, again, when we look at um, Egypt and Mesopotamia. So prehistory is a time of major shifts in climate and environment. Modern archaeology uses um, a stratigraphic process where archaeologists precisely record each level and the location of all objects. Art making, and again, I'm not going to read this whole thing for you. I'm just going to highlight important aspects. Um, it's really important for you to understand that the earliest people were hunters and gatherers. Um, about, um, I think that's a mistake. I think it should say 120,000 years ago. <laughs> um, who created imagery in many different media. So we're going to be looking at um, fired ceramics, painting, sculpture, and also architecture. And the oldest art found to date um, are rock paintings and sculptures. And these date from about 77,000 years ago. And then what I want you to do on your own is to read um, about specific geographical locations. So we are going to be looking at prehistory um, art in Asia. We're going to be looking at it in Europe. We're going to be looking at it in the Pacific region. And these are different characteristics that we should pay attention to in terms of um, looking at these objects from these regions. So please take the time to read this, okay? Don't skip over it. So Paleolithic art, let's talk about some characteristics. Before, before the Neolithic Revolution, it is likely you would have lived with your extended family as a nomad. And a nomad is a person that moves around or travels around and doesn't have a settled home. Never staying anywhere for more than a few months. Always living in a temporary shelter. So we don't really see much architecture or or, or permanent architecture during this period. Um, you're always it's constantly searching for food. Um, you don't really own a lot of things, again, because you're traveling and moving around. It's, you know, you don't have to pack a lot of stuff. And this change to the Neolithic way of life was huge. So when people did begin to settle and grow their own food and domesticate animals, they had um, a source of food. They started to socialize and make friends. Um, they built comfortable homes, more permanent homes, and so the art changed. So we do start to see a shift. So this is the Venus of Willendorf. Um, this is from the Paleolithic period, and it was found in Austria. So this is um, prehistoric Europe that we're looking at. And as you can see, it's very tiny. I know you can't tell um, from this image, but it is, is small. You could hold this in your hand. So Paleolithic art is going to be small, portable, um, and, you know, something, you know, very small in scale, usually. And we'll talk more about this work. So before I give you um, our paradigm of art historical analysis in terms of analyzing this figure, maybe stop the presentation and see if you can jot down a few things or maybe make some deductions based on um, our cornflaking method. You know, what is the content? How is our eye focused? What is the style? Um, who is the patron? Um, what setting might have this been viewed in? Um, where, um, what did it function as? Okay, so maybe just try to stop and, and do that for a few minutes and then you can start the lecture back. Okay, so hopefully you did what I asked. So let's talk about the content. Um, I think when you look at it, you can see that it depicts a woman figure. And, you know, in terms of the style, it definitely is not realistic. Um, her features are very exaggerated and accentuated, um, especially in the reproductive areas. Here she has very huge um, breasts. You know, she has a very big stomach that sort of overlaps over her, um, onto her legs. She has very tiny arms. She does have arms. It's just the view that we're looking at this in, but they're very tiny. And then she has a head, but she has no face. 
So think about what this could mean. What is the artist trying to express by exaggerating certain features of the body and maybe hiding certain features of the body? So the figure was made from stone. That's something else that we should think about the medium, especially you know, when we look at sculpture, stone um, versus wood, often um, very important people could afford to have things made out of stone. Um, we'll see this later in art, in art history periods, especially with architecture. Um, so it was made in stone, um, possibly one from a riverbed, like the one um, that she was found in. Um, and this is, that's where she um, was discovered. We know the figure was carved using a subtractive technique and at one time was probably painted. Um, so subtractive is taking away. So you have this block of stone and what the artist did was um, take some sort of tool and, and carve out, um, um, carved out the body. So let's think about the context of this work. Um, what was the function of it? Um, and um, how do we interpret its meaning? So first, it's easiest to address the figure size. I know you can't tell from the slide, but it is very, very tiny. She is very small and fits comfortably into a hand, meaning that nomadic people at the time intended to take this Venus, and that's what it's been called, the Venus of Willendorf. Um, Venus is the Greek goddess of love, and we will see many, many works of art throughout art history that are um, referred to as Venus. Um, and Willendorf is um, the, the area that she was discovered in. So Paleolithic nomads um, had to carry their art around with them. So Paleolithic art was portable. Um, the accentuation of her anatomy also suggests that she was meant to be an idol, perhaps of fertility, because her sexual organs are the ones that are um, the most prominent. Um, at this point of the human race, reproduction was so essential that people of the time probably started de developing beliefs and placing sort of significance on this need. So this work of art, this expression of art, was created out of a need to reproduce, that it was very important. Um, it was a very important part of life, okay? And so it would be natural that um, the art would reflect this. The first work that we're going to be studying. Um, this is on your AP um, list of 250 works that you do have to know. Um, I usually put stars by them and I, I do think I have it in another slide um, just to note that that's a required work that you have to be familiar with. So this was a significant discovery. I know it doesn't look like very much, but approximately 25,000 years ago in a rock shelter in the Huns Mountains of Nambia on the southwest coast of Africa, an animal was drawn in charcoal on a hand-sized slab of stone. The stone was left behind over time, becoming buried on the floor of the cave by layers of sediment and debris until 1969, when a team led by a German archaeologist, um, Wint, you don't have to worry about spelling his name, excavated the rock shelter and found the first fragment above left. So that's what you, you see here. Um, the archaeologist named the cave Apollo 11 upon hearing on his shortwave radio of NASA's success of the space mission um, to the moon. So it's named after that space station. It was more than three years later, however, after subsequent excavation that the archaeologists um, discovered the matching fragment above right, um, that archaeologists and art historians began to understand the significance of the find. In total, seven stone fragments of brown-gray quartzite, which this is the stone or rock, some of them depicting traces of animal figures drawn in charcoal, ochre, which is um, the type of pigment that we, we often see used in cave painting, um, and also a white pigment, were found buried in a concentrated area of the cave um, floor. After art historians and archaeologists um, began to date um, these, these rocks. Um, at the time of their discovery, um, these were the oldest dated art known on the African continent and among the earliest evidence of human artistic expression worldwide. So 
It's a very simple um, work of art to look at. It's, it's, you know, it's two stone fragments with some sort of animal depicted on there. We're not quite sure exactly what type of animal, and obviously this is prehistory, so there are animals that existed then that don't exist now. But I want you to think about the choice to recreate this animal figure. Why did the artist choose to do that? What does that express about um, what was going on? or the desires or needs of people living during that time. So think about it for a minute before I tell you the answer. Okay, so I think this really clearly shows at the time the stones were created that animals were a large part of human life and essential to survival. We know that people at this time were nomadic hunters and gatherers relying heavily on game or hunting of animals to sustain them. But the choice to paint them suggests the animal held more spiritual placement in these earlier societies. So since their discovery, there have been more recent um, discoveries of much older human artistic, artistic endeavors. It's important for you to remember um, that this discovery really informed us and gave us this sense of how the need um, to be creative and to express um, creativity um, even before the invention of formal writing um, was really important during this time. So again, you know, this idea of art being innate and, and something that all humans universally appreciate, um, I think can be traced all the way back um, to, to prehistorical times. So genetic and fossil evidence, we're going to talk about the origins of art, um, tell us that Homo sapiens atomically anatomically modern humans who evolved from an earlier species of hominids um, developed on the continent of Africa more than 100,000 years ago and spread throughout the world. But what we do not know, what we have only been able to assume, is that art too began in Africa. So is Africa where humanity originated home to the world's oldest art? If so, can we say that art began in Africa? So here I have a map of Africa, and again, the location of where these, slope, these um, slabs were found. It is really important for you to look at the maps, um, and there is a section, um, a video might, or an article might have you read about why maps are important, but really understanding the geographical locations, like in this instance, Africa. We're talking about Africa being the origins of art. Um, again, I mentioned earlier how in um, a lot of um, art history courses, they would use prehistoric art from Europe um, as an introductory um, to art history. Um, but, you know, that art is not as old as the art that we've seen come out of Africa during this time period. So this is a view of the Apollo 11 rock shelter that overlooks a dry gorge. So I just wanted to kind of see, give you a visual of what the geography looked like. Um, it, it sits about 20 meters above what was once a river that ran along the valley floor. The cave entrance is wide, about 28 meters across, and the cave itself is deep, 11 meters from front to back. Inside the cave, above and below the layers where the Apollo 11 cave stones were found, archaeologists unearthed a sequence of cultural layers representing over 100,000 years of human occupation. In these layers, stone artifacts typical of Middle Stone Age periods, such as blades and pointed flake, um, flake, flax, um, or flake, flakes scra um, and scrapers were found in raw material. Um, not native to this region, signaling um, stone tool technology transported over long distances. Among the remnants um, were ostrich eggshell fragments, um, also bearing traces of red color um, that were found as well. Um, either remnants of ornamental painting or evidence that um, these ostrich eggshells um, were signaled to be used as containers um, for pigment. So here we can see the entrance to the cave. Um, and, and, and during um, the later Stone Age period, um, additional rock paintings were discovered. Um, and we'll be looking um, at um, cave rock paintings um, later in this unit. So let's focus our attention back to the Apollo 11 um, cave. 
um, let's see if we can um, further our paradigm of art historical analysis and, and see if we can break down um, and figure more out about this work of art. So we have a slab that's been broken into two pieces, so we can assume that it was one, uh, one big piece um, earlier. And what we see is an unidentifiable animal form. At it, and I do suggest you look closely at it. Again, remember that activity I had you do where you power sketch. You don't have to do that, um, but remind yourself to really kind of look at the details and note things that might not be obvious right off the bat. So when we look at it, it kind of resembles a feline in appearance. Um, I think the legs are a little bit strange. They almost look human or humanoid, um, at least the hind legs do. And maybe these were added later. Um, barely visible on the head of the animal are two slightly curved horns. So those are kind of hard to see. Likely belonging to an oryx. And this was a large grazing antelope um, that existed during this period. Um, on the animal's underbelly, possibly the sexual <laughs> organ of a bovide. Um, and this, again, was a type of... Um, sort of grazing like a cow. So perhaps we have some kind of supernatural creature, um, a sort of um, composite of different animals, part human, part um, animal. Um, if this is so, um, this may suggest a complex system of shamanistic belief um, taken together with the later rock paintings that were discovered and engravings um, in the Apollo 11 cave. Um, it, it becomes more of a suggestion that perhaps some of these um, images were ritualistic. Um, we, you know, and, and perhaps this site um, was significant, um, significantly used over many thousands of years um, for ritualistic or worshiping purposes. Ritualistic aspect um, could serve as a, as, as a function of, of what this um, object um, was intended. For. Um, and, and going back and talking about the global origins of art, um, again, when we're looking at this work of art, remember that this is during the Paleolithic time um, and that these people were hunters and gatherers. Um, but it's interesting and, and it's a very almost what we might think of as a modern concept for a human during this period to draw an animal form and charcoal, you know, something motivated this, this artist. Um, and so this is a form that is much imagined as it is observed. Um, and this is what makes the Apollo 11 cave stones so interesting. So I know when we look at them, you know, it doesn't look that, you know, it's, it might not look as interesting or vibrant as some of the later art that we're going to be looking at. Um, but it really points to this idea of humans um, who during this time period weren't anatomically modern, you know, but behaviorally modern um, in the sense that they had this ability or that early humans possess this new and unique ability um, of symbolic thought. So that's a, that's a really important concept. Um, so that's why we're studying um, the Apollo 11 stones. Um, also some, some characteristics, um, again, to remember and think about are that archeologists refer to this type of art as art mobiler. Um, and, and so these are small scale prehistoric, prehistoric art or objects that are movable. Um, but it's important to remember that mobile art and rock art, um, which we're going to look at too in terms of painting, generally is not unique just to Africa. Um, it is a global phenomenon that can be found across the world in Europe, Asia, Australia, and North and South um, America. And we will be looking at um, other examples of prehistoric rock art and, and cave paintings in these, in these different regions. While we cannot know for certain what these humans intended by the things that they made, um, by focusing on art as the product of humanity's creativity and imagination, we can begin to explore where and hypothesize why art began. So I'm going to stop here. Um, this is your, during what you'll see me do during these recorded lectures. I, I try to do them in small chunks. So this, this is about 25 minutes. Um, and I have you, you know, start watching them during class or, or during, you know, for homework. 
Um, but we are going to cover, there are going to be many, many parts. So this is part one, there'll be a part two, probably a part three and four. Um, so stay tuned.